picture this. There's a woman, kind of smiling, but not really. And she's just staring at you. She won't stop staring at you. This isn't a horror story. It's actually one of the most famous paintings of all time. Here's the thing. Sometimes it's easier to convey an idea by visualizing it rather than listing a bunch of facts or numbers. And as you can see, that's true for our friend Mona, or Lisa, but it can also be true for data. Hi, I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, art appreciation. <laughs> no, it's real world statistics, and I'm getting rid of this. Keep in the beret though, it's cute. Visual information helps us get to key takeaways so that we can focus our brain power on making decisions about what to do with the information we have. There are many graphs or charts that all serve different purposes. After all, you'd use different tools to create an oil painting versus a watercolor, right? It all depends on the data you have and the story that information and you are trying to tell. And knowing the options out there means that we have more tools to tell stories and know when someone might be trying to fool us. With a graph, we always start with the same blank canvas where we'll create our masterpiece. In many cases, these elements include something like axes, which frame and label the information we're about to display. And in some graphs, additional grid lines like the tick marks on our ruler can also tell you more about where each point falls. Let's say your art history professor handed out a getting to know you survey and your class is now reviewing the results. There is a lot of data in there about studying, sleep habits, and most importantly, Italian Renaissance artists. But it's hard to draw any real conclusions just from looking at an ocean of numbers. So let's see how this could look in a graph. We know about histograms, but those aren't always the best choice for displaying data. Like say if we really wanted to see everyone's favorite Ninja Turtle, I mean Italian Renaissance artist, well, that's a categorical variable. So a bar chart would work really well. Those are typically used when you want to compare things between different groups. They look a lot like histograms, but they work differently. Both have a Y axis that shows variables representing frequencies on a vertical border, but each also has an X axis on its horizontal border. In a bar graph, that x-axis represents different qualitative categories, and their order doesn't matter. We could order them in a particular way, but we'll probably do that based on something like the alphabet or by the height of the bar. Just remember to keep an eye out for any issues like bias labeling or any distortions that seem to tell a different story than what's actually happening. That's something you could see in many types of graphs, including bar charts. Even without any issues, though, you still might want to tell a slightly different story with the same data. A a bar graph emphasizes differences, sure, but maybe you want a visual that reminds people that there's a bigger picture and that everything is just part of a whole, so to speak. In a pie chart, a circle represents 100%, and the wedge sizes are proportional to their representation in the data. So it doesn't matter if your class is 30 people or 300 people. If a third of the class loves late Renaissance Queen Artemisia Gentileschi, that wedge would take up 33% of the whole pie. Take that, Donatello! You can still run into some problems with pie charts, which can become overcrowded or slanted at angles that make them hard to interpret. They can also make some data points look more common than they actually are. That doesn't mean they're not important, though. Looking at any single variable graphs can help you see patterns more clearly and understand data in new ways. But they're only the first data visualization brushstrokes on the way to becoming Artemisia. Like, say we want to know if there's a relationship between the amount of sleep your class is getting and the the amount of time they report studying for this class. Your goal here is to prove that studying is important using a visual to get the point across. That calls for a graph that can show a relationship and specific data points, like amount of sleep and amount of time spent studying. A scatter plot uses an x-axis to represent the independent variable, sleep, while the y-axis represents the dependent variable studying. Trend lines can also add structure here, showing the general direction and size of the relationship in graphs, like a scatter plot. The trend line is going down here, suggesting that the more time you spend sleeping, the less time you spend studying. Now, we'd need to do a little more work to see if there's a causal relationship with this correlation. Like, does sleeping more make studying more effective? Or does sleeping more just leave less time available for studying? Or is there some secret hidden variable we haven't thought of yet? Sometimes we need more structure than a scatter plot can provide. A line chart looks a bit like a scatter plot, except each data point is connected with a line. These charts are common in cases where the x-axis represents time passing, like if we're tracking the amount I've spent on coffee this week. 
Maybe that's why I haven't been sleeping. Paying attention to details when making graphs is important, because we aren't just collecting data and screaming into the void. We want to take action based on our findings. Otherwise, how can we really argue that studying matters? Okay, so let's say we actually want to make a chart. Let's look at the class Italian Renaissance data that correctly recognize that, much like Judith, Artemisia slays. We're working with categorical qualitative data, which is a good fit for a pie chart. While spreadsheets can work differently, most of the functions are pretty similar. Here we're using Google Sheets and we just click the insert tab and click on the chart option in the dropdown. These options might change in the future when they get updated, but the idea will stay the same. We look for the pie chart option and then we pick a title. How about something really exciting like Fine Art History 102 Preferred Renaissance Painters? I'm sorry, fun is great and all, but data visualization is all about clarity, people. Now, maybe we want to really emphasize how much Artemisia stacks up, so we want a bar chart instead of a pie chart. We go back to select a new bar chart option. If we want the bars to be in alphabetical order, we would first need to sort the column in the actual data first. Again, we can customize the title like we did before with the pie chart, but we also want to make the x-axis label more informative. The subtitle of the graph is a good place to give some context about where these data come from. We could also make a different graph on something like class sleeping habits. That would work well for a scatter plot. We'd want to select two columns before inserting a chart. Then we'd choose the scatter chart option and make sure we have the x-axis representing sleep. All of these options are great. They'll make for a stronger chart, and they'll also let the data tell a story way faster, like how Artemisia rules, or how I really need to study more. To really get the most out of a graph, though, we need to understand it. That's important for convincing people to understand your conclusions, and also avoid getting duped. Suppose my friend Isabel brings me a graph and asks me if I'll sign their petition. First things first, what is this graph about? Well, I can clearly see the petition is trying to save the iguanas, and now I'm gonna be honest, I'm already on board and I don't even know what iguanas need saving from, but Let's just look at the graph anyway. The x-axis is time in units of years, and the y-axis is the number of iguanas. I can see a downward trend over time in this graph. These iguanas need saving. Annotations, like extra text boxes or arrows that point to parts of the graph, are also useful. They're important for calling attention to different elements. But on this graph, there's also a part that is very far from the rest of the data that has a wide error bar around it. Those are typically used with estimates of a value, like the standard deviation around a mean, rather than concrete measurements. Those estimates come with some uncertainty, so the bar represents that. Now, we wouldn't be surprised if the true value was somewhere within the error bar. Isabel helpfully annotated that point to anticipate my question. Apparently, it was hard to collect data in that year, so that year's count is an estimate, and likely an underestimate. Now, Isabel could also have done other things to jazz up their graph, like adding color to make certain points stand out. Of course, if they do that, it'll be important to pick colors that are actually, well, distinguishable. And this means for a variety of people, not just Isabel. For example, colorblind viewers may have a hard time distinguishing red from green or blue from yellow. Luckily, there are tools out there that can help us check whether there's enough contrast between the colors that make up a data palette. Graphs should be accessible to a broad audience. Adding elements to graphs can be incredibly useful. But it can also get confusing, which is why graphs might need to add a bit more information to help people grasp their message. A legend can tell us about the use of colors, symbols, or line types that separate different categories of data within a graph. That's a key part of highlighting new insights and making a graph effective. Now, I could still ask more questions about Isabel's graph, like whether that decline I see should be considered a large one, or if it is just something that could have happened due to chance. But for now, I've seen enough. Isabel is victorious, and I sign on to the petition. That was pretty straightforward, but it's good to remember that graphs can be misleading, sometimes intentionally. Like, what if in their quest to gain sympathy for iguanas, Isabel had exaggerated the decline by manipulating the y-axis? If each grid line represented a very small amount of change, then a big drop might seem more dramatic than it actually was. Or what if someone who didn't have Isabel's same passion for iguanas made each grid line represent a very large amount of change? then at first glance, it wouldn't look like there was any change at all. Like, suppose in your art history class, your professor really wanted Sophonisba ba Anguissola to win and accidentally made the nearby Leonardo da Vinci wedge a color that was really close to the color of the Sophonisba wedge. At first glance, you might think that the Leo and Sophonisba wedges went together. Or maybe someone titled the scatter plot between sleep and studying something clickbaity, like avoid sleep if you want to get good grades. That title implies 
causation between sleep and study habits, which we do not have evidence for. And it also goes a step further by leaping towards study outcomes rather than merely time put in. This is also good to think about when making your own graphs, which are always honest and never misleading, right? It's natural to want to try out all of the new features of the tools you are using to make graphs. But remember, you want a simple graph that lets a reader understand an image quickly and convincingly. And also, your audience might not trust you right away. Think about how you can avoid choices that lead to misleading visualizations or overstated conclusions. Being honest in how we display data builds trust, and recognizing what dishonest data visualization looks like can also help us know it when we see it. That's important no matter what you do or where you go in life, even if your masterpieces don't wind up under lock and key in the Louvre. After all, it's not just scientists who make graphs, and it's not just academic journals that publish them. Graphs can communicate a lot of information in a direct and clear way. No matter what you're doing, it usually helps to show people information rather than just telling them. And the more we do that, the more we learn about the world and make connections. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall real world statistics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, smash that subscribe button, and comment your favorite Renaissance artist or Ninja Turtle. Thanks for watching. See you next time.